The politics of governing, governing the Internet, next on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs at UWM and Milwaukee Public Television present International Focus, a global magazine linking Wisconsin and the world. Welcome to International Focus. I'm Robert Sigliano, Director of the Institute of World Affairs at UWM. Traditional notions of governance rest on the model of a defined territory under at least nominal control of a unified leadership structure. This model, however, has proven inadequate when applied to the Internet. With its global scope and distributed control, cyberspace is resistant to the rules that govern other systems. How will the tension between government desires to control the flow of information and cyber libertarians' push for unfettered access play out? To help us explore the evolving question of who governs the Internet, we're pleased to be joined by Dr. Milton Mueller, professor of the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University. His research focuses on property rights, institutions, and global governance in communication and information industries. As one of the founders of the Internet Governance Project, he helped create an alliance of scholars involved in global Internet policy issues. His latest book, Networks and States, The Global Politics of Internet Governance, examines the Internet as a site of institutional innovation that transcends the nation-state and serves as a source of conflict between national and global forms of regulation and control. Milton Mueller. Milton, welcome to International Focus. Thank you. It's great to be here, Rob. So, so Milton, I mean, the, the, the question that sort of just really seems to jump out to me, which is we, we, we we've all have familiarity with the Internet, some more so than others. It seems like this vast, very powerful um, uh, institution involved in world events and involved in mundane tasks. How is it that at this stage we're asking ourselves, who's running the place? <laughs> Well, that's because there's no single place. I mean, the, the Internet, uh, there's really no the. We shouldn't even use the word the, but we can't, we can't resist it. Um, well, what it is is it's a protocol. It's a piece of software that allows any computer to talk to any other computer. So all of the networks are really independently managed, and there's about 40,000 different uh, autonomous systems or networks on the Internet, and... And they're all just scattered all over the world, so it's very difficult to uh, to say that this is a, a thing or a place that could be regulated the way uh, an oil company could be regulated. So how how do we? You know, there's certain things that, that we all rely on. You know, we know that that if you there's a certain there's an internet address, for example, and you know that if you go there's if you go to this particular ad- site, it is a individual site. You know, so there has to be some. Out of necessity, some rule making here, some exactly. decision making. How does this happen? There, there has to be coordination, uh, and particularly when you're talking about identification or identifiers, there has to be unique identifiers, just like you need a unique telephone number to be able to call somebody. So this uh, coordination actually takes place through uh, transnational institutions. In the case of domain names like uh, you know, Milwaukee.org. Uh, the domain names are coordinated by, uh, at the top level, by an organization called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And with the addressing uh, structure, uh, there's also uh, organizations at the regional level who do that, who are uh, assigned to world regions such as Europe, Africa, uh, North America. So, so the the um, there definitely has to be this this at least basic kind of architecture to keep this flow going. What about the other end? I mean, what do we need, and where 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 are where are we going in terms of trying to uh, more elaborate forms of governance? That's the big question. Is that uh, we pretty much have the the coordination of the technical infrastructure is in place. We have uh, standard setting organizations. We have the identifier coordination processes. But the big question is. W- What about conduct? What about the things that people do on the Internet? And how much of that should be regulated? uh, And where should it be regulated? Should it be done at the national level, at the local level? Should it be done by the private companies that are running the Internet service providers? uh, Or should it be done by some big global governance organization that has a a lot more authority than it does now? So that's a question that we are, in fact, uh, constantly debating in one way or another. Now, who are the who are the big players then in this, in this that are that are trying to either assert control or or at least have a seat at the table when it comes to dealing with some of these questions? Well, the it's probably best to organize that uh, along stakeholder groups. So we have 
the world's governments. They are used to, they are accustomed to regulating communications and information inside their own country. And so they naturally view the Internet as something that should somehow be susceptible to their policy control. And to a certain extent, of course, it is. A, an Internet service provider in Brazil has to follow the business laws and privacy regulations of Brazil insofar as they do business in Brazil. Uh, it, it gets sticky when their activities go over multiple jurisdictions, of course. And so in addition to governments, you have the, the private sector companies that offer Internet services. And as we know, there's always uh, some degree of tension among the different economic interest groups that are involved. And then you have uh, sort of advocacy groups or civil society groups that are trying to uh, articulate and promote certain norms, be it freedom of expression or child protection or anything from along that spectrum, uh, people will be... Uh, trying to influence what both the companies do and the governments do. So the, the interesting thing about the Internet is that in, in many cases we see the emergence of new global institutions that uh, are put together to allow multi-stakeholder representation to address some of these questions. And we also see a great tension with the traditional national governmental structure in which national governments want to assert their power in this new context. So the the um, let's let's look at the the governmental realm. Uh, now uh, I'm assuming that the United States f- feels it has sort of a primary role in this, um, uh, given the number of private en- entities on the internet as well as its history with the internet. What are, what are, what are, what's at stake in terms of um, uh, how governments assert that control? Who emerges as a, a leader, or is there likely to be a country that that becomes the manager, the primary prime mover when it comes to dealing with is- issues of, uh, of the Internet? Well, I hope not. I hope that the Internet stays uh, this kind of uh, fairly decentralized, autonomous, and um, cooperative uh, framework within which people uh, cooperate in, in the movement of packets and the movement of information uh, because it works for them. And, uh, and everybody has dominion over their own network uh, but governments do not come in on a top-down basis and start ordering people around. Um, but you're faced with this classic problem in political science, you know, that, that Thomas Hobbes described uh, of, of the Leviathan and the war of all against all. Only in this case, it's not the individual people that are engaged in the war of all against all. It really is more like the governments. So uh, who is going to be the dominant government among all of the 200 and so governments that are connected to the Internet, uh, are they going to get together collectively and decide what to do? Very unlikely, because they're so different and there's so many of them. So what's happened is sort of that the U.S., because of its historical role in developing the Internet, has uh, a kind of a de facto centralized and globalized control. They are the ones who created ICANN. Uh, they are the ones who ha- have a, maintain a contract over the, the domain name system. And, of course, we have a very powerful industry here. And, and uh, as we learned with the WikiLeaks thing, if, uh, if the government is displeased with the major uh, thing happening on the Internet, they can tap into some of the major hosting services, uh, the search engines, the Internet service providers, and it can, it can have a lot of influence over what happens. So to some extent, what we have now is the U.S. government acting as kind of a de facto global leviathan, if you will. Other governments not so happy with that, uh, pressing against the U.S. government to share some of its power. And, But really, most of the real governance decisions are still made by the Internet community itself, by the, the ISPs, by the network operators, by the technical community, and to some extent by the users of the Internet uh, in terms of their ability to use the technology and make it do things that they want to do, regardless of what rules are allegedly put forward by governments. Now, the, the U.S. Uh, um, has taken a position, Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton has taken a position in support of Internet freedom. Yes. Um, is, is that the practice? It's, it's a mixed bag, okay? I don't, I, I'm actually quite happy that uh, the, Clinton, uh, the State Department under Clinton has come out so strongly in favor of Internet freedom. Uh, but on the other hand, there are other pressures within the U.S. government to rein in the Internet and make it more susceptible to U.S. government control, 
of course, when things happen that the U.S. government doesn't like. So one of the things the U.S. government really doesn't like is that they're very heavily influenced by uh, copyright interests, uh, the motion picture studios, the uh, the music industry, and uh, and some of the like pharmaceutical companies. And these these companies have some legitimate complaints in the sense that uh, the nature of the internet makes it so easy to share and distribute uh, digitized information that uh, there's no question that music files and movie files are being shipped around and exchanged as if they were emails. Um, something many of us predicted would happen 10 years ago, but uh, uh, they weren't really ready for it when it started to happen. So these companies are pressing the U.S. government to impose stronger and stronger regulations on the Internet in order to protect uh, copyright uh, or trademark holders. So there's a constant tension between the promotion of Internet freedom uh, which says, network away, make your connections, uh, share information, free flow of information. And the copyright context, which says, create a border around this information, create a property right around this information, and if you don't prove that you're the legitimate owner of it, then you shouldn't have access to it. That's something that is one of the major drivers of Internet governance going forward. So this this idea, I mean, it's, it's fascinating in the sense that, that uh, you know, we have governance trying to... Ex- to exert control over the internet, but the internet sort of coming back and saying, "Well, maybe governance doesn't work anymore in this realm." And so, property rights, which is a or rights, which is a typical form of of governments and rule of law, you're saying may be a difficult concept for the internet. Well, you can have property rights, uh, but their their scope and authority is being drastically eroded. So, for example, many people now will buy iTunes, they will buy music instead of uh, getting it for free over some peer-to-peer file-sharing site. But the monopoly profits that are being made uh, by the copyright holders are drastically reduced over time. And their business model has had to change in ways that uh, uh, are pretty fundamental. And the same thing is going to happen with the movie industry and with the distribution of, of motion pictures. Pretty soon we're, we're going to have to simply arrive at new forms of distribution that uh, somehow both protect copyright where it needs to be protected and at the same time allows the incredible advantages of the Internet to be taken advantage of. And we don't know where the sweet spot is yet partic- with respect to movies. Um, what we do know is when the government tries to tell Internet service providers that they should spy on every packet that you ship over the Internet in order to see whether an illegal movie is being sh- shipped over there, in some ways the cure may be worse than a disease, that we may be, uh, in order to protect this uh, narrow property right, we may be sacrificing so many other freedoms and so much flexibility in the exchange of information that we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, I want to. I want There's so many other issues to explore, and I want to. When we come back from the break, talk a little bit about this issue of cybersecurity. Now, and kind of get a different realm. We'll be back in just a moment on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call four one four. Two two nine three two two zero, or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about governance in the internet with Dr. Milton Mueller of Syracuse University. Uh, so, Dr. Mueller, the the um, Cybersecurity has also been an issue that the, the, the Obama administration has has made a priority. Um, can you talk a little bit about, again, I mean, this changing notions of security when you're dealing with something uh, that seems so um, uh, wide open, like the Internet, where we hear about cyber attacks on the, infrastru- the nuclear infrastructure in Iran and, and business, businesses being attacked in response to uh, sanctions against WikiLeaks. Help us understand what the security landscape looks like. Yes, yeah, security is, is another major driver of the demand for some kind of global governance or Internet governance. And we've approached this in, in various ways. Uh, part of it is simply to secure your own network. I mean, there's a lot of really obvious things you can do 
involving firewalls and uh, various forms of checking uh, for malware or, or blocking of spam that can uh, really enhance your security uh, on the Internet. And a lot of the really bad things that have happened have simply been uh, sloppiness and uh, unpreparedness on the part of a lot of government agencies. Uh, but on the other hand, there are more fundamental um, uh, changes that people are calling for. For example, uh, strengthened uh, identification and identity on the Internet. And that raises all of the, sim the, the trade-offs with privacy. And uh, we have, uh, you know, you've probably heard about the warrantless wire wiretapping program of the U.S. government. So a lot of uh, what we're doing to achieve greater security involves greater surveillance and, and uh, greatly enlarged powers of surveillance for governments uh, or for private companies that are providing the Internet service. So you have to decide, you know, how is this going to work? But the fact that the information is so easily re replicable and easily shipped around means that uh, whatever one territory does, one government does, uh, really doesn't have much of an impact Unless it's global in scope, uh, it's not going to have the kind of impact people want it to have. So again, you're, you're pushed more and more towards some kind of global governance. Now, when it comes down to issues of national security, one of the things I'm really concerned about is that this sort of habit, this mindset that is so deeply ingrained in Washington, uh, coming from, you know, 50 years of Cold War, basically, or after the Cold War ended, uh, then we had the war on terrorism, uh, the concept of security is so linked to the idea of the nation, which is not appropriate in an Internet context. Uh, we, we need to speak about the security of users on the Internet, regardless of, of what nation they're in. And it's not clear that the national government is the best place to implement security policies, precisely because it gets uh, wrapped up in interstate competition, where... One government wants to obtain cyber superiority over another government, and they develop cyber war capabilities and cyber espionage capabilities, and the other government does the same in, in, in kind of an arms race scenario. And then at that point, we're not talking about the security of Internet users. In fact, we're drastically undermining the security of your ordinary household or business user of the Internet because you're making them basically hostages in a, in, in a cyber war. So... We, we need to come up with innovative ideas to avoid that scenario, to, to deal with Internet security on a global basis that is not about one government achieving superiority over another, but about protecting people on the Internet as a global space for interaction. Now, if we look at the other side of the, the debate, those that would say, you know, hands off my Internet, this is an ungovernable space, uh, you know, let 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 all those you know many flowers bloom. Let people do what they need to do or want to do on the internet. How how do some of these notions of uh, or these uh, pressures of, of of government control for things like intellectual property rights or security mesh with the, this vast amount of of individual and and non governmental users of the internet who who I assume want maximum freedom in what they do. Well. Yes, whatever we do has to protect uh, a lot of that freedom, a lot of it, because it's very creative, it's innovative, it's economically productive uh, most of the time. However, no user wants uh, to be inundated with spam. No user wants to have their systems broken into by people uh, who then disrupt or, or damage what their, their networks or their, or their computer. So, uh, in fact, that's part of securing freedom, too. If, if you... You know, if I have police protection against some criminal coming up to me with a gun in the street, then I am more free than if I didn't. Uh, so I don't view uh, security and freedom as a trade-off. I view it as uh, one dimension to the other. As security is needed insofar as it enhances freedom. And when security starts to uh, restrict freedom too much, uh, then, of course, not only is it not uh, warranted, but it can actually undermine itself, that uh, when you give people arbitrary power, for example, to spy on you, you may or may not be making yourself more secure. You may be making yourself less secure in a number of unpredictable ways. So, uh, yes, I think we need something like uh, an understanding of what our individual rights 
on the Internet, and that this has to be f- applied fairly universalistically insofar as we can get governments and the rest of the world to go along with that. And, of course, there are so many different values at, at stake in the world. Some people think they have a right to to censor information that uh, is uh, anti-religious, for example, that insults a particular religion. Uh, I think the technology is flexible enough that we can say to those people, look, uh, we can set up a system such that you can block or deny, uh, uh, you, you can prevent yourself from receiving or being exposed to those forms of information you don't want. And uh, that doesn't mean you need to get them off the Internet or, or blow them up or, or destroy them. You simply have to tolerate and accept their right to, to advance different views. It, it seems like we, 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 and we have these two tugs between sort of chaos and order, that whether it's planned chaos or, or unintended chaos or, or, or these various attempts at order. Um, how is this going to be dealt with? Going forward, I mean, how all these these forces we've talked about and the actors we've talked about, how how are they able to, or how will they be able to work out these very fundamental issues? Well, one of the strengths of the internet is, in fact, uh, that it uh, facilitates uh, decentralized, spontaneous ordering because of its uh, decentralized decision-making authority over different aspects of the network. So every network operator can establish policies that govern, to some extent, what what they receive and what they send out. And uh, we need to capitalize on that flexibility rather than override it with some kind of a top-down hierarchical structure. The, the um, people in, in the news most recently have been, have been uh, uh, impressed by the, the role of social media and the Internet in places like Tunisia and Egypt and Libya and Bahrain and, and these various places in terms of very being, being partners in this very... A vibrant sort of social movements that have brought changes that the region hasn't seen in, in decades. Um, what, what does that say about the future of, of, of the Internet and, and governance of the Internet? Well, in that respect, I am relatively optimistic. I think that if we don't have some kind of a major 9-11 type event that makes everybody very repressive again, that uh, even countries that are trying to erect barriers, trying to censor the Internet, uh, the, the tide is against them, and there will be more and more of a free flow of information, and that will have long-term political and cultural consequences, um, not all of which can be predicted, not all of which you can say are automatically good, but the point is the idea that you can control and regulate information the way you did in the 20th century uh, around these territorial states I think uh, people are going to gradually let go of that idea, and and I'm hoping that we, you know, push towards a more liberal order, liberal in the in the classic uh, sort of uh, 18th century sense uh, of when we decided to stop fighting about what was the right religion, and say that human beings have the freedom to decide that for themselves, and let's work out a political order that allows people to, you know, maintain this kind of uh, space for for their own decisions. I think that's what we have to do on a global basis for for the internet. Now we, we just have a, a few minutes left, and I want to want to turn our unit of, unit of focus from the national or the large organization down to the individual. So, as we as all as users uh, uh, of the internet, what's our role, or what role can we play in in these very important issues? Well, that's an interesting question. So, so we are in this process of sort of global institution building. You know, ICANN is in is for example. Um, somewhat narrowly focused on addresses. Uh, however, they have set up a participatory structure that allows uh, almost anyone to get involved. Now, to really be influential in that system, you have to be really spending a lot of time on it. But uh, if they do touch on an issue that you're concerned about, there, there is an opportunity to get involved. And uh, we've set up something called the Internet Governance Forum through the UN system, which is supposed to be uh, a multi-stakeholder dialogue. And again, that's something that people can go to to be educated about the uh, transnational issues as well as to, um, to, uh, to try to influence the outcome of those issues. You can simply learn a lot by going to those and find out what's going on. Um, I think we need to start making more use of uh, remote participation uh, uh, and using the technology itself to bring about uh, the kind of dialogue and deliberation 
and maybe some new form of global democracy that can can uh, make these institutions more accountable. We, we just uh, have about a minute or so left. Uh, are you optimistic that we we will we the the users at large of the internet will be able to to, to deal with this sort of state versus non-state uh, uh, nature of the internet? Well, what do you mean by deal with so, it? So, I mean, in other words, we can work out some of these issues, whether it's intellectual property or security, and that the states are important but not necessarily going to be able to control this. Yeah. So it will be it will be politics. It will be political. I think the the interesting question in the immediate term or the you know middle term is whether those politics will get totally pushed back into the national domains or whether they will succeed in forming a transnational movement, a social movement that can actually defend individual rights uh, at the global level because at the higher the levels you go in politics the the more you get concentrated special interest groups so the copyright holders have no trouble acting on a multinational basis uh, the militaries <laughs> have no trouble acting on a multinational basis and, and forming allies and all of that but the the users need to organize to do that thank you very much dr martin Mueller of syracuse university thank you so much for for uh, your insights on the internet to our viewers we'll see you next week on international focus For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 